Happy New Year again. Yeah. In the year 2000, it was the combination of the year and um, Y2K, and then also um, uh, the economy in, in Hong Kong was folding uh, because the British had pulled out. There was the turnover. Businesses were leaving left and right, and their economies in the tank, and that's where the fireworks originate and come from or come out of. So they were selling them for uh, just dirt cheap. So that was that common. So I don't know if we'll ever see another uh, fireworks night like that, but uh, yeah, it was, um, they were plentiful. As we, as we drove over to Kailua, the cloud is still <laughs> over the Coconut Grove area. Yeah, I, uh, looking up on our street, I, I could tell that, uh, and, uh, and uh, Peter mentioned that, that um, uh, it's amazing how many tithers that we have on the street because they commit 10% of their income to fireworks. <laughs> I mean, I'm, that's no exaggeration. I'm sure there are people that make about $50,000 a year that blew up $5,000 worth last night. If you, uh, I don't know if you have, can go online to check that, but there are prices available for those rockets. <laughs> They're not cheap, but uh, we have fun, and uh, we, we enjoyed it. And... Um, yeah, but uh, a little tired. I, was, I knew I had a problem when I opened my iPhone and my facial recognition wouldn't work. <laughs> that's, what, that's when you know you're really tired. All right, okay, there are some announcements. Yeah, so youth group starts up again this week, uh, Friday night, and uh, uh, the, the gals will meet uh, uh, our house this week on Saturday, uh, 9.30 to 12.30. Because of that, the guys I had mentioned, but we push that uh, so it wouldn't be on the same Saturday morning. So we push that back to the 14th. So a week from Saturday here at 8, we'll have um, uh, breakfast uh, here and uh, you know, do a little worship and watch uh, uh, a video teaching from uh, the Family Research Council from one of their uh, men's uh, conferences. We have a newsletter there, and of course, the, always the mention of the uh, Nalima group, and uh, you can fill out a prayer request. They have... Um, a little gift bag if you're if you're visiting with us, and um, and uh, and also if you know somebody that needs some help in terms of uh, uh, economically and groceries and so forth, they do have food boxes that are available for for you or for you to take to someone, family member, somebody in your neighborhood that might need help uh, with that. With that said, uh, yeah, so we'll jump in, and I'm going to do uh, a bit of. Uh, well, sometimes we. Uh, it's kind of a misnomer to use the phrase prophecy update because prophecy doesn't get updated. It just is. <laughs> it doesn't change uh, from year to year. Uh, but um, usually the uh, first Sunday uh, in January or sometimes the first couple of Sundays, uh, we'll take a break from our, our study, which is in Ephesians right now, and uh, go back and look at some prophetic scriptures, uh, and look at the culture, uh, the governments, and uh, uh, and uh, see how those things uh, align with each other, uh, and we're going to do that this morning. Probably there'll be a part two to it next week, uh, and then the following week, <laughs> very appropriately, we're at Ephesians in chapter six, where we began the a section on uh, spiritual warfare and uh, putting on the full, full armor of God. So that's also a great study to, to start the uh, the new year with, with the conditions that we're living in, some of them we'll talk about in a moment. Um, I heard somebody correctly say, I think we need to put on the full armor of God just so we can pray uh, and just so we can uh, get on our knees and, uh, and get with the Lord. I, uh, <clears throat> I thought this was interesting. This is, um, you, you may have heard of uh, Nostradamus. So he, his, his followers uh, always make uh, their predictions based on his predictions. And I'll explain that uh, in a moment. In other words, they look at all of his predictions uh, and they say, and this year in 2023, uh, the following predictions will, uh, are, will probably be, be fulfilled. Now, he has been credited with foretelling the great fire of London, Hitler's rise to power, the attacks of September 11th, the COVID pandemic, and, and a few. Wow, that's impressive, right? <laughs> Until you realize how, how they do that. Uh, and uh, even with, you'll see in a moment, how they stretch things, uh, he's considered to have about a 70 or 71% uh, uh, accuracy rate, uh, which, of course, biblically, that makes him dead. 
uh, yeah, you, if you're not 100%, you're killed as a prophet. So, but, so he's at 70%. So how, how can he be so um, accurate? Well, he, well, here's one for, for this year. Uh, in 2023, Notre Dame says, celestial fire on the royal edifice. Okay, what does that mean exactly? So, so what the, it, it's so vague that um, uh, they may count Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's uh, recent documentary on Netflix. That, that could be the fulfillment, for, for, for example. So unless lightning hits Buckingham Palace, that might be all. They might, they might count that, got that one right. Uh, th- here's, a, here's another one. They're predicting there's going to be another uh, world war. Because Notre Dame said in 2023, seven months, great war, people dead through evil. Oh, that's really specific there, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's a safe bet to say that there'll be some kind of a war this year. People will be dead through, through evil. So that's, that's, how they, that's, how they get, that's how they get to the 70%. So it's always interesting. Also predict there'll be a Mars landing, but... Um, I don't know, Elon Musk has lost so much money on Twitter, and I'm not sure if he can get us there any quicker, although he would, uh, he would like to. But in the Bible, prophets are, of course, correct, have to be correct 100%, 100%. So typically, there is a short-term prophecies and then long-term. So that therefore, you can know if they are accurate or they're truly prophets or, or not. I mean, I, I could prophesy all day about things that are going to happen in 100 years, but <laughs> nobody would really know if <laughs> I was really a prophet or not. So there's, uh, there's evidence that they are a prophet for God in the short term, uh, and so therefore uh, we have credibility what they say in the long term. Uh, Peter in the New Testament speaks about this idea, the prophetic word, and it's in the context of he is saying that uh, that. I, along with uh, James and John, were on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we had a very cool personal experience. Jesus is there. The cloud comes on us. Moses, Elijah, God the Father speaks. Anybody had a better personal religious experience than that? I don't think so. But uh, what Peter says is that, but in comparison to that, we have something far greater than a personal experience. We actually have the Word of God. And he makes reference to that and uh, uses some of the language that uh, we're concerned about this morning. 2 Peter 1.19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which uh, you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came By the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So uh, he's writing uh, not so much about interpretation of Scripture, but of the origin of Scripture, uh, saying it came by the Holy Spirit uh, through holy men. The word move there is interesting. It means to be carried along as a ship is driven or carried in terms of wind. Uh, in its sails. And of course, uh, God is outside the time-space continuum, and therefore he, he can look ahead uh, and tell his prophets what will occur uh, in the future. Isaiah mentions this in Isaiah 42, 9, where he writes, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you uh, of them, so God speaks of things uh, in the future uh, with tremendous accuracy through His uh, through His various uh, prophets. And this uh, this morning, we're going to do what I don't typically do because I typically teach through a passage uh, of Scripture, and uh, that's kind of my my wheelhouse and uh, what I normally do. We're we're going to look at primarily at. Uh, the coming world government. There are so many aspects to uh, prophecy uh, and the days that we're living in. For this morning, we're going to primarily look at that. We'll look at a couple of passages uh, in Daniel uh, and spend uh, the majority of our time uh, in the book of Revelation because um, 
uh, Daniel and, uh, and John, right in Revelation, if you, uh, we get a, a sense of what's happening in the future of the Antichrist, the form of the one world government, and then John comes along and fills in all the blanks. So there's not a lot of guesswork here between the two. Uh, that's why some Bible colleges will have you take both of those books at the same time. Uh, it's one of the reasons also we feel they're very important. So uh, they are both available. Uh, from verse 1 to the end of the book <clears throat> on our YouTube site. Uh, but uh, also it's one of the reasons why uh, I'm just going to not do what I typically do, and I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit uh, between Daniel and John for the purpose of our study this morning. Now, <clears throat> if you want to know more and you want to really see that <laughs> some of the things we're alleging and saying uh, about the future are really from the Bible, then I encourage you to go back and you can do a book study through those. Uh, you can look at the uh, study from last year where we took the nation of Israel from 70 AD uh, and we went uh, all the way through uh, until the establishment of the millennial kingdom. Uh, that's available. <clears throat> the year before we did a study uh, even longer, we called from here to eternity. We started with the rapture. We went to the rise of the Antichrist and all the way to the return of the king. And that's four or five parts. That's all available for you as well. So we're not going to teach uh, in, uh, expositionally through a, a, a lengthy passage. Uh, we're going to go through a couple, kind of set the table, and then we'll look at the powerful players, who the people are today. The globalists is not a mystery uh, we'll look at then some of the things they said, uh, and we'll try to help understand or help you understand why does it seem like the world has gone crazy? Why do we have open borders and we're allowing thousands of people and, thou and uh, thousands of pounds of drugs? There's more fentanyl come across the border in the last year uh, than uh, enough to kill every uh, uh, American uh, in the country. Uh, why does it seem like we have policies that are set on actually destroying the country? Well, well there is an explanation for that. Uh, either either there is a, a force and it's on pur a purpose, it's very intentional, or people have just gone crazy. I, I know you want to uh, you know, weigh heavy on the people have gone crazy thing, because it seems like it, but the, there's actually a force uh, and a group of people behind these things. So uh, th those are the things, some of the things we'll look at this morning. All right. Well, let's pray and hope you had enough coffee this morning. And I thought this should be the one Sunday it would be okay to bring coffee in, into the sanctuary. But uh, sorry, I didn't make that announcement soon enough. <laughs> I happen to have my cup right here. No. All right. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless our time in your word. And um, yeah, these are, these are very interesting days. Uh, that we're living in. And you describe them and speak about them in future, Lord, so that we would not be fearful, uh, so we would understand the times that we're living in, and we pray that we would. Pray this would be helpful to us. Uh, we would shed light on the, on the culture and the times that we're living in. And uh, Lord, there would be, as we even get to our study next week, uh, the, the practical application. What, what does all this mean to live uh, at the end of the end of the days, Lord? And uh, so we pray that uh, lack of sleep, help us be alert, listen, follow along. And we pray that uh, uh, you'd use your word to teach and to uh, even encourage us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at the past. We'll go in the past. In the past, there was a one-world government. I want to, we'll look at how it came about, uh, God's reaction to it, just to help kind of set the table. And, uh, and then we'll go into the, the future one-world government that uh, is, um, uh, is certainly the foundation, the groundwork, and there's a lot of movement uh, going in that particular direction. So let's look at the one-world government in the past. And that's actually found in Genesis 11. Uh, you know it as the Tower of Babel. It's the, if, if it's going to be a new world order, this is the old world order. Notice first, uh, there's a city and the tower, and it's of rebellion. Again, reading it out Genesis 11, the first four verses. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. 
and they dwelt there. They said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for a stone, they had asphalt for mortar, and they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So uh, this rebellion occurs in a time of uh, unity. Notice the one language. Uh, Again, same words is a literal translation. In rebellion, this group of people uh, uh, post-flood are traveling together. Uh, Moses is very clear when he says in verse 2 that they settled there. Uh, versus uh, uh, the opposite, which would be to be dispersed, uh, which was God's intention. That's in verse uh, verse 8. So what they're doing is in direct opposition to what God's asked them to do. How does this one world government come about? It comes about in direct rebellion uh, against God and against God's word. Notice verse 4, uh, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. That's what God has asked them to do, uh, and they are doing the opposite of it. Maintaining unity in opposition to God. And we'll certainly see that in the future, one world government as well. And secondly, notice that they are want to make a name for themselves as opposed to declaring God's name uh, and, uh, and worshiping him. And that'll be true of the, uh, the last world government as well. They're building a tower to the heavens in a sense to join or displace God. We don't need God. Uh, we can be like him in that sense. And, and in that sense, Moses uses a lot of language that, uh, if you look at it carefully, takes you right back to the Garden of Eden and the first temptation. You can be like God yourself. Just eat of the fruit of this tree. Secondly, the response of God to mankind. That's in verse 5 to 7. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down. And they're confused their language that they may understand one another's speech. Uh, Again, one people, one language in opposition to God. Uh, But, uh, you know, the... Uh, there's not a concern. Uh, now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. God's not saying, oh no, if they band together, what shall we do? No, it's, uh, it's, it's very different from that. God looks and says, if they stay like this, what will they do? There'll, there'll be no saving them if they continue in this rebellion. So the confusion of a language at the Tower of the Babel was an act of the grace of God. Uh, God says we cannot allow them to continue and absolutely destroy themselves. So we'll confuse their language. They'll have to do what we've asked them to do and disperse themselves uh, around the world. So the one world government in the past, the very first one, its whole purpose was unity in opposition to God. God dealt with that shortly after the judgment of the flood, not with another judgment, but by grace he dealt with them. That will not be the case, of course, of the future one world government. So let's look now, and we'll jump into here Daniel uh, in Revelation, as I mentioned, as the prediction of the future one world government. I do this a little bit just because there might be people here, there might be people uh, listening in online (coughs) that... um, uh, say to themselves, well, I, I hear you Christians talk about that and everything. I don't even, I don't even know where you get that. You know, how, how, where is that in the Bible? So we're going to, uh, again, not cover it uh, 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 in tremendous detail, but certainly just to, to make a few points about the government, uh, the rising leader that we refer to uh, as, uh, as the Antichrist. So again, Dan- Daniel and, uh, has... Uh, several uh, uh, prophetic visions or dreams that he has uh, interpreted, uh, and they speak of the future. Da- Daniel is, um, is, um, is so accurate, uh, and he gives such detail about future kingdoms that will they come about, that the critics of Daniel uh, have always said that uh, it's too accurate, it's too precise. He couldn't have known these kinds of details. 
How would he know that Alexander the Great and his kingdom would not go to an heir but be split in four? How would he know that two of the four would become much more powerful than the others, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies? How could he possibly know these things? He is a great historian but not a prophet. That would, that would be their, uh, their criticism. The problem is, is that uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was a uh, phenomenal archaeological discovery because it's written. If you just think about this, if an archaeologist finds a pottery and it has inscription or design on it, he can learn a great deal about that culture. But if, if he finds volumes of things written, he learns a lot more and a lot, a lot quicker. In that, of course, was the entire scroll of Isaiah. And um, in it was the oldest manuscript of Isaiah that we had. Uh, and the next one was a thousand years uh, later. And yet those two scrolls put side to side were exactly the same. Again, attesting to the accuracy of, uh, of Scripture. I'm just saying this because if you ever hear about the Dead Sea Scrolls in the news, they'll never tell you these things. All they'll talk about is the writings of the Essenes and so forth. But there's a portion of Daniel that they found also, and they can date it, they can date it prior to the events happening, proving that Daniel is not a great historian, but a very accurate prophet uh, of God. So we'll, we'll, there's a uh, a reference to Daniel 7 we'll make it in a minute that ties in here. Uh, we want to read first from our primary text here, which is Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to read the first couple of verses. We haven't been in Revelation in a while, so just keep in mind, it solves a lot, of, uh, a lot of confusion when you realize this word beast, that there are three of them. Satan is the beast that comes out of the abyss. The false prophet is the beast that comes out of the earth. And the Antichrist is the beast that comes out of the sea, which is what Daniel said uh, in, uh, in his passage as well. well. Let's look here in Revelation 13. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, John writing, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. So we know that's the Antichrist. Having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns, uh, horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast, the Antichrist, which I saw, was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So again, <clears throat> we won't go back. We'll read a little bit. But if you go Daniel 7, then it, it, it explains the imagery uh, of, that John is making reference to. In, in Daniel, the beast like a lion with wings like an eagle, is Babylon. It's, it's not speculation. You can read it in detail, all the references. Uh, that's who it is. The second kingdom is uh, like a bear. Uh, it is the Medo-Persian Empire. The third kingdom is a leopard. Uh, that's Greece. Uh, and the next, historically, the fourth, uh, is terrifying. And it's a description of the Roman Empire. Daniel mentions in a, a, an additional beast uh, which is uh, the one we're talking about here in terms of the Antichrist and thus the last world empire. Just a couple verses from that passage in Daniel 7. It was different from all the former beast empires. It had 10 horns. Again, very similar language, the same. It's from John. While I was thinking about the horns there before me was a little horn, a little one. Again, this is the Antichrist, which came up among them, and three of the first horns was uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke uh, boastfully. The crowns here are diadems, which is what a king would wear. So we're talking about kingdoms and powers. Uh, and, uh, and basically, Daniel has said, John confirms, uh, that the last world empire will be made up of 10 kings or 10 kingdoms. Now, currently, the world, the world movers and shakers, the, the globalists, and we'll, we'll identify some of them here uh, in a moment, they have already, and for several years, divided up the planet into 10 economic zones. For example, Canada, uh, the United States, uh, and uh, Mexico are zone number one. There are 10. There's 
uh, John and Daniel are saying in the future there'll be 10 kings or 10 powers that will rise. Uh, and then a little horn or the Antichrist will be raised up and he will take out three of them. <laughs> it sounds like he'll take them out. And then the other said, will say, hey, yeah, we're good. You be the boss. And, uh, and then he rises, and that's how you get the one leader over the 10 kingdoms uh, that are still yet future. But the planet is already divided up. Uh, and uh, uh, the people that we'll identify in a moment and talk about them uh, already have their plans in motion, and they're pushing hard to see this come about. Their problem is you. <laughs> Generically, the problem is the United States. We kind of love our freedom, and that doesn't work in a global government. And, uh, and in particular, uh, Christians, because we love our freedom and our allegiance to Jesus Christ. So we, we are a problem, which helps us understand why our culture is going crazy. Let's go back to Revelation 13, just to read verse 3 and 4 and kind of complete this before I get too far ahead of myself. And I saw one of his heads the Antichrist, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. So there appears to be a false resurrection of the Antichrist. And all the world marveled and followed the beast, the Antichrist. So they worshiped the dragon, Satan, who gave authority to the beast, the Antichrist, and they worshiped the Antichrist, saying, who is like the beast, the Antichrist, who is able to make war with him. So two things uh, to note. The world stands in wonder of the Antichrist, and they begin to worship Satan. Of course, this, there's a lot, you know, huge deception, even as there's huge spiritual deception today. Uh, again, that's one of the things we'll, we'll at least mention uh, this morning. Uh, notice it's the whole world now, not just a revived Roman Empire, uh, it's the whole world that begins the, this worship of the Antichrist. John continues, still in Revelation 13, now verse 5 to 8. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for, for 42 months. Again, this is the tribulation period. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So uh, he rises uh, again out of the sea, this would be the great sea or the Mediterranean, that period of time. Uh, he is the last world empire. Uh, verse 4 says, who is like the beast, who is able to make war uh, with him. So such claims means there's tremendous allegiance to him. Uh, there apparently is no more concern about the Islamic jihad around the world. Uh, they've all been taken care of and uh, are no longer a threat to uh, anyone. And when we use the term Antichrist, which is a term used in the Bible besides other, other terms used for this man, uh, anti, again, is a Greek word. You, you're learning how much Greek you, you didn't even know. Ant, it's, just, it's a Greek word. We just say it into English. Uh, and it means instead of, also against, but instead of. So when this man comes on the scene through intrigue, but he rises to power, uh, there's a false death resurrection that uh, I'm sure all the uh, majority of the media will cover, uh, and he'll be a very charismatic individual, a great uh, uh, speaker, uh, and so forth. He will be a friend of Israel at first. Uh, he'll bring peace uh, in the Middle East. He's charismatic as a speaker and in terms of his personality, uh, and he'll be the head of the European Union, or we might say the World Economic Forum. Whatever form it takes is a transition into that government, and he will be loved by the world because of his accomplishments. He will be like the Messiah, and people will see him as that way. He is against, but he is instead of. And there's a lot of people looking for him today. And uh, 
<laughs> and uh, a lot of examples of that. But it's, uh, yeah, very frightening. There's people uh, in Israel that are uh, dedicated to doing everything they can to bring the Messiah on the scene and see the temple rebuilt and so forth. Uh, there are those in this uh, globalist uh, group that uh, uh, are, are looking for one leader to rise to, to lead them. <laughs> they don't think it's going to be Klaus Schwab. A little too old, not so charismatic, doesn't speak well at all. So of, of those that are there right now, uh, we don't know who it will be. And, his, and we won't know who it will be because his identity will not be revealed until after the church has gone in, in the rapture. But we certainly can look at all the signs that are happening uh, around us. Uh, again, <clears throat> therefore, discussions today about a one-world government, one-world monetary system uh, that maybe we'll try to touch on uh, next time, all leading to the rule of this person, the Antichrist. Our good friend David Hawking says, as Christians, we should be wary of all attempts to promote world government, either through economics, politics, or religion. According to Bible prophecy, it is satanic. Without the rule of the Messiah, world government is doomed to failure it is Satan's plan and will result in the persecution and death of believers. Now, the church age believers, us guys, you know, we're, we're with the Lord, but tribulation saints will, will suffer uh, during, during this time. And, uh, and yet, uh, uh, we see today Christian leaders uh, involved in this globalist move towards a one world government. They have no idea what they're getting into. And part of the problem is they. They have left the Bible and the teaching of the Bible a long time ago, and many of them may have never had any kind of uh, uh, grounding in God's Word when it comes to the prophetic future at all. Uh, we'll mention one, one of them of note uh, is, uh, as we get a little further into this next section, which is, number three, the powerful leaders behind, behind the scenes. Again, uh, these are wealthy powerful bankers, insurance companies, media owners, and so forth. They're all based primarily in uh, uh, Western Europe. Uh, we, we're familiar with the old school names of Rothschilds, uh, Morgans, Rockefellers, and so forth. The George Soros, uh, the list is not very long. Uh, some of them are actually Jewish, but left Judaism a uh, very long time, time ago. And they believe that the world will be better off uh, if it is connected globally and we get rid of all of our borders, uh, they believe we'll be better off economically and socially, and they'll be better off as well because they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll rule everything. Uh, I don't know. Do they think they're going to be the Antichrist? I don't know. But they, they think they're, they're going to be the movers and shakers uh, that control uh, every, uh, everything. Here's a, a, a quote uh, from... Uh, uh, Larry McDonald, former congressman, this is the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies. Those names are changing, but the idea is the same. is to create a one-world government combining, here it is, super capitalism and communism, and it's really moved now towards purely socialism under the same tent, all under their control. Do I mean a conspiracy? Yes, I do. I'm convinced there is such a plot internationally in scope, generations old in the planning, and incredibly evil in its intent and he made sure that at one point in time, that statement was uh, entered into the congressional record. Uh, today, the, uh, the world movers and shakers are primarily connected with the World Economic Forum. And uh, uh, we've mentioned this before, <clears throat> but they came out with their, about two years ago, and they're still, still driving it hard, this idea of the Great Reset, because they saw uh, a tremendous opportunity to reset the world's economy uh, and cultures and so forth through COVID. They were trying to drive it before uh, through the environmental movement uh, because if you're going to control people, if you're going to get people to give up their freedoms, the primary way you do that is through fear. Of course, fear and manipulation, but as we saw through COVID, it was through, it was through fear. And uh, we saw how crazy uh, all that was. Yes, you, uh, it was, uh, they closed down every church pretty much in the United States in the drop of a hat. 
the bars could be open, liquor stores could be open, you can get an abortion, you could buy your marijuana, you could do all these, other, but just don't go to church because that's really going to spread the virus. That, that should have told us something right away in the first couple of weeks. Uh, their, their leader, of course, is, uh, is uh, Klaus Schwab, Klaus Martin Schwab. He's an uh, engineer and uh, the driving force behind the World Economic Forum, uh, but uh, he's got other major players. Of course, Gates is involved was Prince, now it's King Charles. If you, There's very interesting reading about him. He's incredibly wealthy, uh, and he is incredibly powerful. He is so tied into Islam, it's unbelievable. They have honored him and given him special ceremonies and dignitaries and so forth. Very, very interesting character on, on the world stage. He's an evil guy. Uh, and then you've got our good friend, the doctor. I, I'm not sure if he's... Uh, going to be able to stay out of jail or not, but uh, right now he's uh, going to retire. And of course, George Soros, uh, you may be familiar with him, working very hard for the uh, demise of the, in the major cities uh, around uh, our country today. But here's the next slide. This is uh, Rick Warren. You may have heard of him. He's attended many of these annual <coughs> conferences in Davos, Switzerland, uh, and he's become such uh, good friends with all of them that he was one of their guest speakers in the, uh, the last one, 2022. As he says, I'm here at Davos with a lot of my friends, and we're talking about what are the biggest problems on the planet and how we are going to solve them. Because uh, Christians are a problem to this agenda, and they realize it. Of course, again, the United States is a problem in terms of their agenda because we we love our freedom, uh, and the only way that we, we will change if there's enough anarchy that comes along that people will cry out for that, uh, someone to rule over them, uh, and that's why we're seeing some of the cultural changes around us uh, today. Uh, Rick Warren and others are right in there uh, with them. Uh, you should be uh, aware of that. He's a best-selling author. He's one of those guys that's going to be interviewed on uh, major networks, at Easter time and Christmas and so forth, <clears throat> but um, but he is uh, he's hanging out with the wrong crowd and uh, and he's uh, being used and so forth. But he's not the only guy. There's uh, uh, there's a lot of Christians that have bought into this socialistic doctrine uh, that have moved very far away from God's word. It's one of the problems. We talk about the necessity for us as believers to pray for revival. We're praying for other Christians, right? You got to get vibed before you can be revived. So the revival is for the church. If the church rises up and becomes the church, <clears throat> we make these people very unhappy <laughs> because a lot of their plans uh, go, by, go by the wayside. One of the reasons we pray for uh, a revival. Uh, again, uh, their solution is uh, they call it global, global socialism. Klaus wrote about it in his uh, book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, where he describes what a cashless society would look like uh, in terms of global socialism. Uh, these guys put it on their website. We used to talk about uh, this, uh, this uh, secret cabal that would meet and all that. They're not secret anymore. They just, they just put it right out there, uh, what, they're, uh, what they're all about. Uh, in, in their system uh, of living, in their system of government, no personal property. No one owns anything personally. It's all provided by the state. It's, it's really a Leninist Marxism uh, at its uh, very core. Uh, it describes that, uh, Klaus uh, describes it as a world where individuals move between digital domains an offline reality and the use of connected technology to enable uh, and manage their lives. And they have a slogan for it. It's called Build Back Better. I don't know if you ever heard of that before. That's what it's called. World leaders uh, uh, are using it because they're all connected with these guys. And of course, oh yeah, yeah, and Joe's using that, that title too. Now don't fault Joe. <coughs> Joe, they're just happy if Joe can find his way to the bathroom during the day. I'm not exaggerating. If you've ever seen some of the things he said and not said, he's just, he's struggling uh, with his mental faculties, uh, but he's got a group of people behind him and just 
Joe, read this. Joe, read this. Joe, say this. No, Joe, don't talk to those reporters. He's very, they're very guarded uh, with him. And then you got Kamala Harris, who when she was on an overseas trip, couldn't remember uh, who North Korea was from South Korea. Uh, but, you know, most young people are okay with that because uh, on a typical university campus, this is true, they ask students, where was the war in Vietnam fought? Oh, gee, I think that was before my time. That's not a trick question. It was in Vietnam. You know, I'm not making this up. These are people on university campuses, and um, we'll let you know part of the problem of that here in just a moment. The great reset is to create fear. They need a crisis in order to control uh, the outcome. Now, the crisis was that we're driving, that they were using, was, was climate change. Now, I don't know what you think or have learned about climate change, but just think about a few things. <clears throat> One of the principal players behind this, of course, is the current president. If he really thought sea levels were rising, would he spend millions of dollars building a house on the beach in Waimanalo? I don't think so. Bad investment. Besides the one he already has at Martha Vineyard. And he's not the only one. These guys fly around in private jets. They could care less about the environment. They build right on the beaches and the best places and so forth. But the, the rhetoric that comes out of them is very, uh, very different because there needs to be fear in a crisis. And interviewing a lot of people in major cities today uh, in terms of that subject alone, they are, they are very fearful uh, of the environment. Now, they did come across something better, a global pandemic, <clears throat> and um, that became very important to them. There's a quote here by Klaus. The pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and there's our key words, re reset our world. Now, if I told you that there is a flu coming uh, in 2023, and that flu would uh, would, would kill some people, but people under 70, people under 70, 99.9% would recover. So not too bad. People over 70, 95% will recover from this flu. Well, that flu has a name. It's called COVID-19. How did it get to be the killer virus then? Listen, I lost a friend to... Uh, uh, to COVID-19. People have died from COVID-19. Uh, Kev and, and uh, Dennis were in the hospital on ventilators. It's a very serious thing, but uh, again, the flu kills thousands of people every year. So how did we get to these lockdowns and all the draconian measures used against it? Well, it's very intentional, and there is a driving force that was behind it. Harvard and John Hopkins study released uh, showed the, the concern that uh, because of the lockdowns, 900,000 Americans will die in the next 15 years because they didn't get their cancer screenings and the surgeries and so forth that they should have had. Uh, uh, some say that it will, uh, our, our children will never recover the two years lost uh, in, uh, in the classroom. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been devastating. Uh, but uh, there's a reason why they're able to do it, and they're familiar with uh, this guy's words uh, here, uh, who is, uh, again, the diab you can go to the next slide, the diabolical uh, communicator of Nazi Germany. Goring says, it's always a simple matter to drag uh, the people along, whether it is a democracy, a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of their leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they're being attacked. Denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism, exposing the country to greater danger. It works the same in every country. Fear is the, is the driver. Uh, so much that we're faced with is propaganda. So again, one world government in the past it was all about rebellion against God. In the future, it would be as well. Uh, there will be a rise of the Antichrist out of Europe. Uh, there will be 10 economic zones, 10 empires or leaders. He will come on the scene as the 11th and take three of them out, and the other seven will submit to him. 
but he'll come on and be a man of peace and a friend of Israel. He'll allow the temple to rebuild uh, in Jerusalem and so forth. And, uh, and right now, those people that are driving that agenda are not secretive. They, they are just straight out there uh, saying what they want. I, I, uh, I, I hate to, to, uh, to even mention this, but I just mentioned it as a point of contrast and maybe help understand uh, how, how uh, this whole thing works. The former president was not a globalist, and he's one of the few, so they hate him. So they call him a racist, xenophobic. They say all these things, horrible things, constantly. Now, I don't agree with everything he says. I don't agree with everything that he did. But the reason they hate him so much is he's not a globalist. He doesn't, he doesn't play ball <laughs> with them at all. And, uh, and they hate him. And they will go after anyone viciously if they don't go along with their agenda. And they are very powerful. So let's look uh, fourthly here. And uh, lastly, for this morning anyway, the present symptoms in our culture. And uh, I'm going to cover uh, just seven of them uh, now. And, and of course, I've already alluded to uh, uh, more than a few of them. Uh, the symptoms include confusion and misinformation. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive uh, many. So the deception will uh, be widespread. Uh, again, for many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ, and will deceive many. Are Christians deceived today? One survey by a Christian magazine said that 90% of Christians in America today do not believe that Israel, the modern state of Israel, is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. 90%. They have no, no clue as to uh, some of the things that uh, you are uh, so familiar with if you've been around Calvary Chapels for very long in terms of Bible prophecy. Confusion and misinformation. Just a couple of slides. Here's the, uh, uh, I don't know if you realize this or not, you may not keep up with it, but the current Pope, he's not Catholic. What do I mean by that? He's just not Catholic. He doesn't hold to Catholic, Catholic doctrines. He's calling for interfaith prayer meetings. Uh, and he's doing it, and he's having them not in places he's visiting alone, which he does. Uh, he does it right, right at the Vatican. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of confusion uh, out there today. Uh, here's a, a slide of a multi-faith meeting that was, uh, was held in Egypt of, of a group of people uh, connected with the UN. Some of those same bastards and religious leaders that claim to be Christian that are connected with the group in Davos, they're more than happy to uh, get together with people of other faiths. <clears throat> Listen, I have no problem sitting down and eating a meal with somebody of another faith. We're talking about spiritually joining together and praying together as though somehow we're connected, and, uh, which is, uh, again, spiritual deception. Spiritual deception, confusion, Here's a good slide, just to show you the mask alone. <laughs> they, want to bring it, they want to bring it back again. L.A., it's like if you can avail, uh, avoid L.A. County, avoid there. If you cannot spend money there, don't ever spend money there. They are so corrupted. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. This was just this week, the New Yorker case for mask, <laughs> wearing masks forever. The Atlantic, should everyone be wearing, the, wearing masks? It's just a point of control. If you don't know, John Hopkins and others did, a, did a studies post-COVID-19. And what they found, you may know this already, but wearing a cloth mask did nothing just to prevent the virus from spreading. If you wear a really good M95 or better and you never touch it and it's properly fitted, it can help some. It can help some. But that's not what most people wore, of course. How about the vaccine? Well, it turns out the vaccine manufacturer said from the beginning, it will reduce the symptoms in individuals, but it will not stop the spread of the virus. And we now, we now know that that is true uh, is, as well. And yet, we just elected a governor who did all those things uh, as the uh, lieutenant governor insisted on the lockdowns, which turned out did nothing, 
China's having a problem right now, right? They got 250 million people with COVID. How did that happen? They welded their door shut and kept them inside for two years. That's how it happened. So none of them ever got exposed, and now they've all got it at once. But that's okay, because they just opened up travel. <laughs> Let's see if we can uh, wrap this thing up, up, up again. It's, uh, the deception is uh, unbelievable, and of course, with Elon Musk taking over Twitter, uh, we're finding out what we're calling the Twitter files, uh, now that <coughs> everything we thought was true was true. Any doctor, any research scientist, or anything that said contrary to the uh, public government uh, uh, narrative of COVID-19 was shut down uh, on, on Twitter, and uh, their Twitter site's taken down, as well as any... any uh, conservative person with a voice and, uh, and so forth. All that, uh, what we thought was happening, uh, turns out we have the documentation for that. Uh, anxiety today that's being created in our, in our culture. Therapists say they can't meet the high demand as anxiety and depression linger from the detriment of all the, uh, the lockdowns. By the way, how, how did places do that didn't do the lockdowns? You know, we have in our own country places like Florida and others that thrived in terms of their health, uh, in economy, uh, in education. But there were other countries in Europe that never shut down, never missed a beat, never closed school for a day, uh, and, uh, and they excelled and did very well in all those categories as well. Not just educationally, but this kind of stuff in terms of uh, uh, psychological problems uh, as well as uh, uh, health uh, itself. So all the lockdowns, uh, again, did not work. Even the World Health Organization now admits that and were very detrimental. But a lot of misinformation uh, that's out there. Misinformation, here's Planned Parenthood. Uh, they edit the fact sheet to say there's no heartbeat at six weeks. I'm sorry, that's just a lie. <laughs> because somebody was promoting a a bill that would limit uh, uh, abortion, uh, and so they, they don't want people to know that that baby's heartbeat uh, begins uh, as early as it does. So they'll just lie, is, uh, is what they do. Here's the other survey that I came across I thought was uh, pretty interesting, explains a lot, but of course is very frightening. Uh, most people under 40, the majority of people under 40 years old, get their news from one of four sources. The number one source for news is, what do you think it is? You get CNN? It's Twitter. That's not a news service there, by the way. Number one source is Twitter. Number two is YouTube. No, you go there to learn how to fix stuff and build stuff. That's, that's what that's for. No, they go there for their news. Number three Facebook. Awesome. No wonder they're so astute as to what's going on in the world. And, the, and then fourthly is Apple News. Only, sl only leaning left just a little. <laughs> I, I look at it on my Apple phone once in a while just to see what the liberals are saying. But uh, uh, under 40, most under 40, that's it. That's it. That's where they're getting their... So there's misinformation and there's confusion in, in, our, in our culture. My point, I think you'll all agree with that. The point is that's by design. Those people I introduced you to earlier are driving this. That's part of the point. Why? Because we are a problem in the United States. And we are a problem in particular if you're a Christian uh, in the United States. Present symptoms of our culture. Secondly, the symptoms include open borders. We've mentioned that before. This is just from um, this week just to give you a uh, if you haven't been uh, tracking this, record high number of migrant encounters reported at the U.S. border since the start of the physical year 2023, as thousands of people are crossing into the country each day, according to Customs Border Protection sources. As of Thursday, they have, there have been 617,250 total migrant encounters at the border since October 1st, a new record for the months of October, November, December. See, uh, BP sources tell Fox there's an average of 6,858 encounters uh, each uh, and every day. And that's not counting the gotaways, what they call the gotaways. And of course, um, uh, President Biden is right uh, when he says the border is secure. It's secure on the other side. The cartel's got it locked down over there. 
and, uh, and they are becoming fabulously wealthy uh, in the last two years because all those people pay physically uh, in money, but also, of course, uh, emotionally and brutalized very often. Uh, many of them die on the way. This is one of the most inhumane things that we've ever done as, as, a, as a country. Uh, and, uh, and, and with it, and, and do you understand how it works? They, they come across and they say, I want asylum. And they say, okay, fill this paper out. Okay, we'll, we'll release you. And you know, you'll have a court date you know, to see whether you, we can grant you asylum. That'll be in about three or four years. So, you know, just we'll, we'll try to contact you in three or four years. So we call it catch and, uh, and release. How did the previous administration do it? it? says, you want asylum? Okay, wait over there. We'll work on it. When your court date comes up, we'll get a hold of you. So people are, are like, I'm not doing that. I'll just stay where I am. Oh, there you go. But uh, it's crazy. I've seen video where the drug cartel guys have drones, and they put their drones up, and they fly them, and it's like, and, they, and then their, their, their companions um, uh, release uh, migrants down here to cross, so now uh, all the border guys converge, and now it's open down here, and then that can run all their drugs through and get it through. So the drugs we're talking about are just the ones we know about, not the ones that got through uh, with, without our knowledge. Records amount uh, of fentanyl were seized by the uh, U.S.-Mexico border in 2022. Drug smugglers trafficked de the deadly drug into the U.S. Uh, a decade ago, we didn't even know about fentanyl. Now it's a national crisis. The U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of California said in a, a statement, the amount of fentanyl we are seizing at the border is staggering. Again, enough to kill every, every American many times over. Uh, that's why there are some in Congress that say, say we should declare it a weapon of mass destruction. Oh, yeah, and where does the fentanyl come from? Oh, that comes from China. Oh, we'll just look the other way. We'll let it, we'll let it get to Mexico because it goes in. So you have the World Economic Forum, guys. What do they want? The demise of the United States to clear the deck so that they can put in place their agenda. Who else wants that? Well, in a way... CCP, China wants that. Their, their problem right now is us as well. So anything that they can do in cooperation, they're happy to do that because they both want the demise uh, of this country. And, uh, and we see that in terms of drugs uh, flooding the, the country. Again, uh, they've seized uh, enough fentanyl to kill every American in the United, uh, in the United States. <laughs> Let me show you another slide. Now, this is uh, uh, David uh, Millibrand. He says, the higher you build the wall, the more you empower the smugglers. No, actually, that keeps them out. <laughs> Who is this guy? Well, he's the head of the International Rescue Committee. The IRC is a major NGO with 20,000 employees and a budget of $800 million a year. So the people that are promoting open borders are well-funded. Go back to George Soros and those guys. Where's all this wealth coming from to fund this? It's coming from them because they're driving a particular agenda. The third symptom includes a change in law enforcement. Now, we saw a lot of, a lot of discussion. We saw on our news outlets in the last couple of years the idea of defund the police. <clears throat> Do they want to get rid of the police? Actually, they don't. They want to get rid of local police. They want to get of local sheriffs. The, the people, you know their name. The people that grew up down the street from you. They don't want those guys around. They want a federal law enforcement. This began with the Obama administration. He tried to push it. Of course, the, uh, the next guy, I don't think we can say his name. The next guy did, did away with all that stuff. Uh, and it's back uh, under Obama, excuse me, under Biden. Uh, again, so they, uh, they want anarchy in the streets. I saw a headline on my phone this morning <clears throat> and uh, on Twitter, no, on Fox, <laughs> talking about the anarchy in the streets of Illinois because of a law that went into effect today. It was passed uh, in the middle of the night by their state uh, legislator, quickly signed by the governor, uh, and uh, people there are very afraid because it's a complete cashless bail system. 
So you can, you can commit a crime and be on the street in 48 hours. Now, they already have that in, uh, in California places in San Francisco because they've declared by their duly elected, funded by George Soros district attorneys, saying that we will not prosecute anybody for any crimes uh, of theft under $1,000. So when they go out to steal, <laughs> just make sure it's under $1,000. So when you see these videos of all of these smash and grabs, uh, I, I, I uh, heard um, another Calvary pastor this week who was visiting San Francisco. He was in a CVC uh, there to get something. And um, he said a guy came in and went to their electronics area and, and grabbed a, a bunch of stuff off, off the shelf and uh, waved at the clerk and went out the door with it. And he said, did that guy just steal that? Oh, yeah, it happens like three times a day. Well, how do you do business here? We're not. We're closing this store. We're closing all the CVCs in San Francisco. We can't do business like, and even, even Starbucks, the bastion of liberalism and light. They're closing all, all of their Starbucks in San Francisco because they can't handle what's going on there with the... Uh, homeless that like to hang out there and don't always make it to the uh, bathroom properly. So that's what they've been dealing with. It's uh, anarchy, and now we've got it on a state level. Uh, it's all, the point is it's all by design. That, that, that's the problem. Uh, anarchy is the bridge to the Great Reset, and so it's of necessity. When you think about all these things in our culture that's happening, it's like, why has the culture gone crazy? Because it really has. Well, actually, there's a driving force and agenda behind it. And again, uh, that, that is the way that Stalin did it. Uh, he didn't do away with the police. He instituted a federal police. If there's a federal police, that means there's one guy in the White House, and whoever controls him controls all the policing. Now, we're already seeing some of that as the Department of Justice has been completely weaponized. And we, we could give you a lot of examples, uh, inclu including the former president, but uh, uh, here's uh, uh, one. Pro-life activists arrested FBI raid Pennsylvania. Uh, this guy's uh, name uh, is Mark, uh, Mark Hulk. You can go to the next slide. He's in the middle. That's his uh, wife with him coming out of federal court. What was his crime that the FBI came to his house at 7 in the morning with guns drawn to arrest this criminal in front of his wife and his children? Uh, he's a pro-life leader, uh, and he was standing on a public sidewalk and uh, handing out uh, tracts and information to ladies that might be going, going into Planned Parenthood with an attempt to get them to rethink the idea of aborting their child. Someone got in the face of his 12-year-old, so he kind of pushed him back to practice son. That guy filed a complaint. It was considered a misdemeanor. It was all held locally until the Department of Justice got a hold of it. And now they, uh, they go in guns a-blazing, 7 o'clock in the morning, to, to arrest this guy that volunteers uh, at, a, uh, at a pro-life organization on, on the weekends. That's weaponizing the Department of Justice against your political opponents. Uh, and there's other cases of that is happening as well. Fourth uh, symptom is inflation. You know, that's not really a mystery how that happens. You know, if you have a fire at home and you throw gas on it, it, it kind of goes up. So if, you're, if you are coming out of a uh, a hard time economically because of COVID, and then you uh, borrow a trillion dollars, that kind of, that, that actually causes an inflation. There, there is worldwide inflation. Some countries have done much better than others. Uh, we have done terrible when it comes to that, and it's all because of policies. It's all because of policies. There's, there's something behind uh, even that. The fifth symptoms, including the querying of our children. Now, that's a generic phrase, and I think you understand what it means. Uh, there, there is through our schools and our educational institutions uh, and so forth, even uh, uh, political leaders uh, that uh, are seeking the demise of our children uh, because it, it rips the home apart. And, uh, and that's what they're seeking to do. So they've got, this has been going on for a very long time in terms of in the public schools and so forth, gro grooming kids uh, to be homosexual, grooming them now to be trans transgender. Transgen 
Is, is that a thing? How is that a thing? Uh, and how is it that now uh, we're, we'll pay for the surgeries? But here's an interesting statistic um, and why, why they're involved. Uh, it's part of the transhuman movement. Transhuman, I'll just read this definition. Transhumanism is both a scientific movement and a philosophical system whose adherents attempt to use technology to accomplish one primary task to eliminate weakness in the modern man. Klaus and these guys have an eschatology. They believe that through the development of machinery and AI, that at some point in the future, they're going to be able to upload their consciousness to it and continue to live. I'm not making it up. That's what they actually believe. And all the things they're, they're doing now uh, are, are all driving towards that. Can we get used to this idea of becoming something that we're not uh, currently? Right now in our country, there are thousands of children that are eight years old and younger that are being given Lupron. Lupron is a drug that causes chemical castration. At one point in time, prosecuting attorneys wanted to it wanted it to be given to rapist as part of the penalty. And our court says, you can't do that. You, you can't make someone take something so detrimental and dangerous. You can't do that. It's illegal. But we're giving it to eight-year-olds. As though an eight-year-old is, is uh, fully aware and can make these decisions for themselves. It's going on. It's going on right here in Hawaii. It's, this is not like, hey, crazy people on the mainland. It's going on right here. Why? Because it breaks down the culture, it breaks down the family, and it breaks down the idea that we are all made in the image of God. And they, they don't want people to understand that or know that. Because if you're made in the image of God, therefore you respect every person, therefore they can't drive racism. If you're made in the image of God, then you certainly are not going to take the life of the unborn. If you're made in the image of God, then we're not going to say, God got it wrong and we're going to flip your gender. So it's all a denial of being made in the image of God. The symptoms include the promotion, as I just mentioned, racism, teaching of CRT and the 1619 Project. And, uh, and again, it's not just in a few schools. It's, uh, it's very widespread. Now, one of the good things about uh, the uh, pandemic and kids uh, uh, being taught online from home is that parents started watching what, <laughs> what teachers are saying to them. And they're like, What? <laughs> It's like, come on, where, where's math, you know, uh, instead of uh, uh, using my kid as a social experiment. And, of course, we've seen uh, some, uh, some pushback that uh, a, lot of, a lot of conservative, a lot of Christians have ran for neighborhood boards. We saw the whole state of uh, Virginia turned upside down. Uh, is a uh, very godly man, uh, a woman, ran for governor and lieutenant governor and the attorney general and uh, in that uh, very liberal county where uh, you saw on the news on a regular basis, that whole uh, uh, school board has flipped. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of pushback on these things. Uh, does it seem like the country is going crazy? Yes. Is there a, an agenda and money and power behind it? Yes. Uh, are there things that can do? Do we just go <laughs> quietly into the sunset? No, that's, uh, that's not the, uh, the idea. But it's important to understand where it's all coming from. Uh, the last one, it, I'll just mention it briefly, is the religion of uh, environmental movement. It is religion. It requires faith. You must pledge an allegiance to it uh, and so forth. Um, it is referred to as the fifth column or the uh, Trojan horse. Um, I have a, a slide for you. If you want to watch a, a very good little documentary, uh, Will Witt does stuff from Prager. Uh, this thing is only like 14 or 15 minutes long. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, uh, Religion of Green. Uh, very, very insightful, very, uh, very interesting. But uh, uh, it is a driving force of what's out there, and there's an agenda behind it. Just a couple more uh, slides. This is the Prime Minister, our United Nations World Economic uh, Situation Prospect. Again, very, you know, you and very much pushing the whole global global warming. Oh, no, it's climate change because we're not so warming anymore. So it's climate change. Is the climate changing? Yeah. If you've ever been to Denver, it, it changes like six times in the same day. But uh, 
Uh, this is the Prime Minister of Norway. We will, re- we will never manage to reach climate targets if we don't create social fairness in, in, in the world. So uh, if you don't have social fairness, we'll never have climate change. Does that even make sense? It doesn't make sense. So if we have, if we have the right amount of uh, uh, gender and race and so forth, then we'll, we'll have uh, reached our goal of climate change. I'm sorry, that's the prime minister of, uh, of Norway. That's, that's not your six-year-old uh, trying to reason this thing out because he heard a news story one time. Uh, John Kerry, of course, he's our uh, czar of uh, in, uh, environment. Uh, this is a very interesting headline. John Kerry spills the beans. The UN's COP27 meeting, they want to replace capitalism with a new economic system. That was the environmental guys. What's the environmental thing all about? It's one of the drivers from the World Economic Forum. It's part of the driver of, uh, uh, of the globalists. They're not following the science. I don't think we can even use that term uh, anymore. So what should we be doing? Well, <clears throat> we should be watching for his return. Uh, and uh, just the fact that these guys are on the scene, no longer secretive, but pushing this agenda should tell us about, uh, a lot about the times that, uh, that we're living in. And, uh, and we're going to look more about that uh, next time, the idea. What, what is the church's response? And, of course, it should be watching, uh, watching for the return of Jesus Christ, uh, living, living for the Lord, living for, uh, for eternity. Uh, that's what our lives should, should be all about. We need to remember that goal. When the Lord returns, will he find faith on the earth uh, is uh, uh, one of the passages in Matthew says. And that faith he's talking about there specifically are believers that are actually praying uh, and getting on their knees before the Lord. Uh, but when he comes for us, hey, we, we want to be doing something for, for the Lord. I've already gone over, so I'm going to close in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, this morning and a lot of information. Lord, uh, we're so thankful that we, we know the end of the story. We know the end of the game. We know who wins. But Lord, uh, we don't want to be complacent just because we know <laughs> the, how things turn out at the end. We want to be living for you uh, and for your kingdom. We want to, our lives to uh, reflect your love, your mercy, and your grace towards others. We want our lives to reflect the fact that we truly believe that every person is made in the image of God. Uh, and we want to reflect that love enough that we'd be able and willing and able to share Uh, the gospel, and take as many men, women, and children to heaven with us when you come for us, Lord. May that be one of our goals as we enter 2023, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, and then communion.